So hello and welcome back to the Assignment Journey podcast. This episode is all about writing the assignment. This is the big one, as Naomi put it in the introduction episode. So we're going today to be talking about paragraph structure, creating flow and critical analysis. And in the middle of that, we're going to talk about some general advice for writing assignments. So I'm your host, Alexander Wood. I'm back. I've beaten my illness and I've come back into this podcast after an absence in the last episode. And joining me today is Fran. So say hello, Fran. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so Fran works in the for the university. Uh, she said in her own words that she implements and translates major policy to the university. But basically, she gets student voice, a bit like how we've got student voice later on in this podcast. Fran completed a master's in higher education policy, and she did a 20,000 word dissertation, which is 20,000 words more than my dissertation was. And she had to be really, really critical in that. So I'm very grateful for Fran t- for giving her time up today to be on this podcast. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, then. So the first thing we're going to talk about in this podcast is paragraph structure. So Fran, right off the bat, why do you think it's important that we actually structure our essays? Oh, God, the big question. <laughs> um, so I remember the, so I did history at undergraduate, so lots and lots of writing. And um, I'm a bit of a waffler that probably doesn't bode well for podcasts, but hey ho. I think paragraph structure is super important because without being cheesy and too cheesy, it takes the reader on the journey with you. I think it can get to a point when you've been doing your research that you you know this topic back to front, complete mastermind on it. Uh, you're there up there with experts, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the reader is on that level with you. So it's all about laying those foundations and working your way up in terms of expertise. And I think that's where paragraph structure can really aid to frame your your research answers, really. Yeah, I think it's really important as well, um, just because if you don't have a paragraph structure, it doesn't really work so there's in my view there's two or there's three different types of paragraph structure that i could talk about there is the overall essay structure in terms of like introduction main body conclusion but then there is also individual paragraph structure so like one paragraph what type of structure we use for that individual thing Mm -hmm. and there's also then the headings that you choose so we did a essay we did a podcast already about how you can come up with the ideas for that structure. So check that out. That's episode two of the assignment journey, uh, structure and planning. So check that out for more information about structure, especially about the main body introduction conclusion stuff. But what I would like to talk a bit is about how you structure specifically a paragraph. So Fran, with your essays, how did you structure, how did you decide to structure your paragraphs? Um, I should have a couple of them in front of me really, shouldn't I? So it depends very much on your topic so i did a lot of my essays on uh, big government policies and um i would start at the beginning of the story i know we're talking a little bit about flow later or as i call it the golden thread Mm -hmm. um my first paragraph let's leave the introduction for now because that tends to cover everything you want to do but i think first paragraph in your own words read describing what the topic is um what the general understanding of that topic is and then try and position where you, you're going to produce that unique contribution, I think, um, is really significant. Um, I kind of uh, alluded to that um, kind of brick by brick. And I think for me, it is laying the foundations and, and working your way upwards. I've got friends that use the paragraph per concept technique. My issue with that, if you can have an issue with paragraph structure, very nerdy thing to say is that it can get quite stagnant um, and that's where you lose the flow. So it is that middle ground between making sure that you are really flagging that each paragraph has got its own meaning and point without being very blocky and looking like a a bullet point list, really, um, I'd say. I think one of the crucial things that's coming out of what you're saying is there's a number of different ways that you can choose which paragraphs you're going to use and how you're going to structure the entire essay. Um, so I did some research for this podcast and I read a book called How to Write for University, Academic Writing for Success uh, by mm-hmm. Kathleen McMillan and Jonathan Ways. Mm-hmm. And in that, they described that there's eight different types that you can use. So fine, you talked about brick by brick uh, mm-hmm. with history. There's that a bit like a chronological approach in terms of you're going from the late, earliest thing to the latest thing. So step by step, what's happened, how things are about developed and so on. I guess so. And I really like the way that 
at the start of this section, you talked about there being different sorts of, um, I suppose, levels of paragraphs. And what I might talk about, say, the Cold War, I remember looking, starting at 1960, looking at, in that paragraph, economy and social, and then moving on to 1970, looking at economy and social. So, yeah, it was, it did tend to be chronological for history as a subject, I guess. Mm. There's something that I would often do, because I was a law graduate, is I would choose, um, almost, I'd compare things, and also a bit, bit, bit chronological as well. So sometimes I'd be comparing various uh, laws, so sometimes I might do it in a chronological order. This is what the law was, this is how it developed over time. Sometimes I would be talking about specific topics, so I'd say, okay, this paragraph's going to be this topic, this topic, and this topic. And I'd try and make them fit like a order by classing them. So I'd have a classification, so I'd say, okay, here's three separate topics, they're going to be the three points. And often you can get those from the actual question themselves, or the words in it. Um, so if you want to find out more about the methods, uh, eventually I will have written these into one of our skills guides, uh, which will be an academic writing. They won't be there for some time, but if you check on there, they might be there already. Or check out the How to Write for University Academic Writing for Success, where they talk about the eight different ways that you can structure an assignment. What I would like to talk a bit more in depth about is structuring an individual paragraph. So what I mean by that is structure is actually a way of writing. So rather than just saying what the heading of the paragraph is and which order you're going to put your points in, it's more about how you can actually write that point down. Mm -hmm. So Fran, have you heard about a method called PE? So point, evident, explain. Yeah, that unfortunate acronym that is. <laughs> Um, I have, and that is used quite widely in history teaching, actually. So it'd be interesting to know whether that's the same in law and other disciplines. So the key caveat to the advice I'm about to give is that if you've been given a model by an academic or a lecturer, then stick to the model that they want. But the PEE structure, which I'm about to explain a different version called PEECL, um, that structure is a very good general structure to use. So in law, one of my lecturers came up with a structure called Iraqdak or something like that. And that was really, I use that to write. But it's a more general writing point. That was, that's specific to law and won't work in the same way that PECL will work. Mm -hmm. So I said the acronym a lot. So you're probably wondering what on earth I'm talking about. Um, so the acronym means, first of all, P is point. E is evidence. The second E is explain. The C is criticise and the L is link. So again, what do they mean? So the point is where you actually say what the point of the sentence is that you're saying. So I always use the example about what the weather is, if that's the question. And the point of the paragraph would be actually the weather is raining. So you'd say weather is raining. So you're saying what the point is quite clearly, almost what the conclusion of the paragraph is. Um... Then E, I'd evidence that. So I'd find some evidence from an academic source or something like that to say why it's raining. So I might have said, well, the Met Office have said it's raining outside. Uh, then I uh, explain why the evidence actually links. So how does the evidence actually back it up? So the Met Office may have said it's raining, but is there any other sources that might make it so to say it's raining? Um, is there any other evidence that there is out there to back it up? Um, and explain quite clearly what that means uh, and because sometimes it's not ob always obvious and trying to be explicit at that point that's what generally the structure is PEE -E. but for university we've said CL and that's where criticize and link come in the criticize mm -hmm. and we'll talk about this in a bit more depth later but when we're coming to critical analysis it's all about asking them questions mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure Fran will have a lot to add about how you do that but this is where you criticize something so that's where you get your critical analysis in like I said more about that later and finally, link. In my eyes, this is almost the most important part. Explain how everything you've already said answers the question. Because you've said a lot of things in this paragraph. Link it back. Use the key question words that there are. Uh, my girlfriend was doing, a pod was doing an essay not too long ago about where do wild animals belong. And her, well, where do animals belong? And her answer was, well, they belong in the wild. They belong in the zoos. They belong in television. But often she'd written these points but she hadn't said this is where they belong and she hadn't got the word belong in her essay at all and so she then ex wrote, so then I told her about that she wrote it explicitly at the end of each paragraph mm -hmm. and she got 90% mm -hmm. um, 
but all it was is being explicit that was the key thing mm. uh, so yeah what do you think about that as a method fran i think it's something that used to annoy me quite a lot <laughs> actually so you're talking about being critical um i didn't like doing a, Le- a levels so i always felt like things were very prescriptive you had to um what do they call it like signpost all your paragraphs in this paragraph i will be talking about x y and z but actually then when i sat down and did this massive piece of work not mm. that long ago and i started reading some of my friends long piece of work i thought do you know what thank god they've signposted that and do you know what thank god that they have phrased that using yeah. the question yeah. because no matter how interested you are in a topic and you know thankfully academic staff love their topic and mm-hmm. for the most part i imagine they enjoy reading student essays yeah um they read a lot of them and it is really nice for them to bring back uh, your hopefully very unique contributions back to what is being asked so rather than seeing it as quite elementary and black and white I think it is just a, a best practice thing so I'm less bitter about it nowadays. So the key piece of advice there really is be explicit and make sure you use the key question words so that the lecturer can see how you've actually answered the question um, but yeah I can totally agree with you when I was in um, high school we were told to use a structure where every point we made we had to explain why it was important and at first I thought it was a faff, but then I realised I was getting those really high marks because I was justifying the importance of everything I said. I was like, yeah. okay, this answers your question because. Yeah. And then I started thinking at university about why I should do that, and actually that really helped. So thank you to my RV teacher who told me all about that, uh, <laughs> Miss Nicholson Ward. Um, quite a shout out there, Alex. Yeah, <laughs> quite a shout out. It was really good though, because she uh, she done a law degree, and actually I then thought, actually, this is something maybe I should be doing. Yeah. And so I always say it, a tag online it felt like a waste of words at first but a tag online this is important because or this or this means or therefore and then yeah. put in your own in the question words yeah. and state the significance because it's easy to say well it's obvious what the significance is but it might be to you but to the lecturer or to an yeah. unknown person outside it might not be yeah okay. um so now that we've got that piece of advice out of the way, so basically use a structure, whether that be a structure that the lecturer has given you or the PEECL structure. Now we're going to look at some other pieces of advice that have been given by students. So I went out onto the streets of the university and I asked them, what advice do you have for writing assignments? Let's hear what they had to say. So what advice do you have for writing assignments? Uh, main advice is start early, because um, research takes a lot more time than you think. Uh, you probably spend two thirds of your time actually researching. So start really early um, and manage your time well. I advise to start in advance, don't leave it for the last minute, give yourself time. Go at your own pace and don't compare with other people. Uh, to plan and then plan again. Uh, Pre-essay plans are great and to also utilise your time, uh, check for staff drop-in hours, etc. And take all the help you can get. Uh, I would definitely say try to start on time, so give yourself a month or more to work on it. Don't just start last minute and then panic, because we've all done that, but (laughs) probably don't do that in the future. So yeah, those were some really interesting views. It seemed like those are quite a common factor. What did you think about them, Fran? Yeah, um... It did make me feel like these people hadn't done an assignment uh, in the past couple of days because they're very, very positive and hopeful, Mm -hmm. aren't they? It makes me want to think when they're saying start in advance, I want to be there. Like, how? How do you start in advance? Tell us your tricks and your tips. Um, But they were it was what lots of wise comments. I think Um, there was a lot of start in advance. I think was the overriding overriding, um, advice there. So yeah, I spoke to these students in January, um, so it was like early January, like uh, early February, so that's why they yeah. are all very positive. Okay. Um, if I interview them now, one, they'll be more busy, and two, um, I assume their advice might change. But yeah, starting in advance is the key thing uh, that came out. Uh, were you ever okay at starting in advance, Fran? No. It's <laughs> terrible, isn't it? I'm glad that I'm in a place now where I, could mi- I can admit that I never start in advance. Um, to me, starting in advance was scary because I felt like my sa- my fate was sealed as soon as I started writing down on that piece of paper. Mm. And that's silly because what I should have done, and this is something you said that you do when we had a little chat earlier, Alex, was just get bullet points down, like write things down um, early and then you've got something and then you, you work your way through them. Um, that's 
my personal statement way, way back all that time ago. That was one of the reasons I didn't start until probably a month before it was due in. It was because I was worried about starting. But mm. I think the, the trick is to um, get down things. Even if you think it's rubbish, you'll appreciate that sort of direction later on. Yeah, I just know that I also was not very good at starting early. I always like to put things off um, and procrastinate from writing. But mm. I was always quite late into doing mm. so. Um, but if you can start early, then do it. The only caveat I would say is if you start early and finish early, that's not always the best thing. Yeah. Um, because if you've start, if you nearly finished your assignment before you've even had your lectures on it, that's not good. So I would always try and start mine after I've had that key lecture on the same assi- topic. Yeah. Um, so that's when I try and start mine, at least starting the research. There's nothing wrong with researching in advance, though, because then when you come to that lecture, you'll understand it more and it might be better. Um, but definitely try to start early and don't leave it to last minute. Have you ever had any situations of finishing assignment last minute, Fran? Um, <laughs> are my parents listening to this podcast? No, they know that I'm a I'm always last minute worker. But um, some for some people like there's no shame in it. It depends on you know some people actually really enjoy that last minute pressure. I mm. think it becomes unproductive when you you know you're not potentially sleeping properly. Yeah. You start to get anxious about things. I think that's when you know to take it slowly but steadily. Um, and you know. It, doesn't matter how last minute you are and I would probably say I'm really at that upper level of last minute um as you said starting the research early you've got more time to understand what you're talking about and that will always show and work I think so I always I always used to finish quite late um because I always put writing off until I had to do it basically but it wouldn't mean that I was unprepared so like some people would be telling me that they had 10,000 like 3,000 words written but that the research that they'd done for that might have been far less than what I had done. Mm. But I had just not started writing mine yet because I would always procrastinate and put it off. Yeah. Um, but then a lot of the time I'd be doing things that would basically be getting me there. So like I would be doing my research. I would be putting my research into a structure, trying to t- do everything I could to basically write, but without classifying it in my procrastination head of having written. Um, but then... It is up to depend on how good you are with the pressure because sometimes when you are close to the deadline, yeah, you start getting nervous. And I've said this a few times in my in some of these podcasts and everything, but there was an assessment that I did leave too late, and I rushed my references and I got marked down, which is mm-hmm. quite ironic. And I've said that a few times, given the fact that people who have referencing questions come to me. Mm-hmm. But I know the what happens when you don't reference properly. So make sure that you give yourself enough time for that sort of thing. And you'll hear more about that in the next podcast about referencing. It's like it's all planned out, Alex. It's almost <laughs> as if you've planned this journey. <laughs> I had to plan the journey because the journey, it's it's slightly different differs with certain people, this assignment journey, but it's largely the same. Everything crosses over quite a bit. So yeah. some people will be writing as they're researching. Some people will be yeah. writing after they research. Yeah. Um, but all interlinks. And that's mm-hmm. what I think is really nice about this assignment journey. Um. Yeah. But one thing that is important that one of the students did say is go at your own pace. So just because your friend might be saying, oh, I've finished my dissertation now, it doesn't mean that it's wrong that you haven't or just because you've done less words than them. And that in my first years, that always got to me because I was comparing myself to other students. I was like, okay, another, all the other students I've spoken to are bragging that they finished their assignments. Mm-hmm. And I haven't. And I thought that was meant I was quite bad at what I was doing. Yeah. But then when we got the marks back in the end, what happened sometimes is they'd rush theirs and they got it done a week early, but then they got like a 50 and I got a 70, for example. Not saying that's what they got, not saying that's what I got, but um, yeah. What do you think about that? Um, It's difficult, isn't it? None of us like answers to be uh, subjective. Everyone wants to know, you know, yeah. what's the question we're asking today? How do you write an assignment? And actually, um, it is all down to what you're researching, what sort of writer you are, which bits you enjoy. Um, I found a lot of mindfulness when I was writing my 20,000 word dissertation. I'd have some days where I was just referencing and, Mm. you know, this could be like a month before it was due in, but my brain couldn't handle any more analysing of, you know, the interviews that I'd done. I didn't want to read any more journals. So that was a referencing day. And um, 
you know it doesn't have to be the perfect referencing but it was it was something so give yourself I think time to to breathe and don't beat yourself up about things because everyone goes at their own pace um, and you just find your own way through I think yeah just um, make sure that you're mentally okay and when you're doing it and the more time you do give the easier it is in terms of nerves and stress Definitely. and I know that I'm someone who can cope doing it in one day at times but then that's not my best work so you can do it in one day but should you do it in one day and the, the, the final student who we asked said we've all been there and they know that they can do it because I spoke to them about this after they finished the recording they knew that they could do it in one day mm. but that's not best practice and it's far more mentally straining to rush it so yeah that's some student advice. Fran, have you got any other advice that you want to give about writing assignments? Um, I mean, I think the, the students did, you know, I said you can tell they haven't been writing recently, but it is good, um, as you said, best practice, what they've been saying. Um, I've already talked a bit about this, but just to reiterate again, no work is bad work. Um, when you first see your essay or your assignment, Write down your first ideas because they could be your unique contribution towards that particular area. Um, the amount of uh, post-it notes that I had to throw away last year because I've just had what I thought was uh, world changing ideas and concepts. Many of them weren't, but mm -hmm. it got me to where I needed to go. So no work is bad work. And then finally, uh, which we'll be talking about in a minute, um, try to grab that flow and that golden thread whenever it comes to you. And I think what Alex, you've just said in terms of being mentally well and keeping, you know, looking after yourself. It's really important when you're creating that flow because you need your brain to be flexible. You need to be able to grasp different types of evidence to pull together a unique way of seeing things. And you can only do that when you're, you're feeling sprightly um, and uh, hydrated and all of that stuff. So, um, yes, yeah, that's what I would advise. So speaking about flow, that's the next part of the podcast that we're going to talk about. It's almost like it flows from one <laughs> to the other. So Fran, why is flow actually important in assignments then, do you think? Um, so I've used this answer before, but it's, it's still important. Flow obviously brings about imagery of fluidity. Sometimes you think of like, I don't know, water, liquid, but actually I approach flow with that brick by brick and those foundations and um, you need to introduce the basic concept to the reader um, and you need to frame it for yourself as well and you go often from basic to more complex and the flow is your guide for that. I do know people that work backwards when they're creating their flow so they know mm. what their unique contribution is going to be. That's how I do um, it. That how, that's how you do it, there you go. That's how I did this podcast as well and yeah. all my work. And I mean that I know some people that works, I mean, that's how they approach everything, because if not, they end up with a lot of evidence and um, points, which ultimately they're not going to end up using. So how that must work well for you, for you to do that regularly. Yeah, it does. And it's something that we've been reiterating throughout this podcast mm. um, is about backwards planning to an extent yeah. and looking at what the end goals are and then thinking about how you would fit those into your work. Yeah. Um, so I think that is really important. So how do you actually make your assignments flow? Because you've spoken quite a bit about what flow is, but how can a student who's listening to this yeah. try and make something flow? Yeah, practically. Um, so it's one of those, unfortunately, I feel like if you really, really force it, it actually gets more and more difficult to do. So if we start from, say, you've got your most basic uh, essay structure is like five bullet points, mm -hmm. and then you bulk those out and they turn into paragraphs. And then your last bit is to make it sound really effective, almost poetic. You, you need to have that golden thread going through. And I think that's where your voice is really important. Um, I think it's an element of authenticity and really bringing yourself to what you're writing is where my flow comes from. Mm. So, um, you know, I'm not a walking um, dictionary or thesaurus. I just tend to use my own my own words when it comes to writing that assignment and before you know it you're reading it and it sounds like a real person that's written it and I think for me that's the definition of flow. Mm. They're not like robotic and yeah exactly. I think at times what one of the ways that we get flow or I used to get flow in is 
I used to do the linking back to the question and following a structure. Right. And then when I was linking back to the question, sometimes it depends on the type of essay that it was, I then try and link it to the next paragraph. Yeah. And then the next paragraph will flow naturally. So you'll probably, if you're listening to this podcast, have realised that we've been using flow throughout this. So, for example, Fran gave her advice, which was about flow, so then I flowed to the <laughs> next part because it felt natural. Mm. And um, so the idea was try and look at what points you've got and try, mm. sometimes try to choose a structure that makes it flow from one to another and mm. think about how you could link them link together. Um, mm. That's one thing that I think is important. We have got a guide or a document that is available as a resource on our skills guides. So if you go to the lit comment description of this YouTube video, or if it's on a podcast, if you go to the university's skills guides, um, then you can, on the academic writing, there is a resource that helps students create flow called Creating Flow. Uh, I think it's in the essay section. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so have a little check out of that and see what you think. But it's all about just trying to make it things linked together. Mm. and sound natural and not sound like it's forced so as Fran said layers on layers at times Mm. um I think your example was very apt Alex using this podcast and I think the way that we we are able to create flow is because we've got a structure in front of us we've got an overview and we know what we're aiming towards and it can be very very easy with large pieces of work um to forget what your main points are so everything should be adding towards that final that final point, really. So, yeah, it was a really good example. I'm glad you liked it. The one part of this podcast potentially fell down on that is when we were talking about the point, evidence, explain, criticise, link structure. When we talked about critical analysis, I had to say that's coming later on in the podcast. <laughs> but that time has come. So now <laughs> it's a time to talk about critical analysis. So, Fran... Yes. What is critical analysis? That was an amazing segue. I'm so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I thought in my head, I was like, oh, this is an amazing chance. Yeah, I mean, so I'm going to use an example, this example of critical analysis to be critical. Um, So I think with the uh, PEE, is it CL or LC? CL. Yeah, CL. Um, It is a very rigid structure. And what I would say is, you know, looking at this podcast whilst it is one of the last things we talk about i i use critical analysis and i implement it from the very beginning um Mm -hmm. of approaching an assignment um for me and the previous assignments that i've done it's been about looking for gaps in what is already out there so um i was quite lucky the the bits that i researched there's actually whole not there's not a whole lot of uh research being done on current policies so it was quite easy to pick things out but having said that there are some policies that have been you know done to death and I am critical by looking at micro examples in those policies so for example um, I look at a policy called the teaching excellence framework and there's a lot of research that's done on how that affects academic staff there's not a whole lot of research on how that affects professional service staff or non-academic staff so I actually ended up interviewing those individuals and how I critically analyse the policy as a whole. So sometimes it is worth looking for those for those gaps because mm. of where your contribution can be. So yeah, um, look for gaps is one example of critical analysis. In um, some students' work, um, I turn critical analysis in basically into, to asking questions. Yeah. Um, so your question is what when you're finding gaps is what's missing yeah. does this cover everything yeah. so you're in your day job you look at um student voice and you look at actually which voices might not be heard and okay. so you ask that question and then say okay let's hear them and so that's how you're being critical but i turn it into asking questions on a day-to-day level like that so the way that i talk about critical analysis usually is about asking questions so, for example, um, a good question I was asking when talking to students is, why do you buy that coffee from that shop? And the student will always come with a reason. So, uh, Fran, do you drink coffee or, or tea? I'm currently drinking a whole cafeteria of coffee, so yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, what made you choose that piece, that drink of coffee then? 
Um, so I must admit, I've chosen this particular coffee because there wasn't a whole lot left in supermarket today. Okay. Um, is that a good enough answer? Yeah, so you chose it because of demand. And then you can talk about the wider context. So the context is uh, the currently um, people are panic buying and so people are buying in bulk in case of changes to their daily lives because of the coronavirus. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's one of your reasons. And so what you've done then is you've justified why you chose something or you've looped into it. Um, so every person in the world is critical and they may not realise it, but all you have to do is turn that critical into your essays. And all it is asking the same questions, they're coming up with the same justifications. So Fran said that she chose her she chose her coffee based on availability due to external circumstances. So the reason why she bought it is because it was the only one she had. Um so that was good to know. Um so another example I often ask students is about if they've got a laptop, why why aren't they using the mouse? Uh why have they got a mouse? And so why do they choose it? So you compare between one thing, a mouse, and one thing, the trackpad on your laptop. And students often say, well, the trackpad's not very good. You can't type at the same time. It's not, it doesn't, not as good for the hands. And, but then there's, there's arguments both ways. And then if you student, if you make arguments between the two things, mm -hmm. so you could say, well, the mouse is expensive. So it's an extra five pounds. You can lose a mouse. You can't lose a trackpad. Mm -hmm. If it's a wireless mouse, it might run out of battery. Mm -hmm. There's all those downsides, but overall, of course you'd choose the mouse. Mm -hmm. If you wanted a mouse, that is. Um, and so students, by making those decisions, are naturally being critical. So my piece of advice is every single thing you do, every decision you make, there is some element of critical analysis in that. The difficulty lies in how can you turn that critical analysis from every day into your academic work. So Fran, yeah. how do you think that students can do that? I think that's an excellent question. As you were talking, it, you know, we are critical every day because we like to do things that are in our best interests and um, without sounding super, super old, like we have a lot of choices in the modern day. So, mm. um, you know, we've got to have that element of criticality. But I think academic critical analysis, much like when we were talking about, um, you know, signposting and essays, etc., there are rules and procedures to follow. Um, which for students make it a little bit easier because um, there are ways that you can be critical that are done in journals, for example. Um, so it, for me, I showcase my critical analysis the most in my literature review mm -hmm. and in my methodology. So um, if you take the methodology, I ended up doing interviews for my dissertation. Yeah. And um, the way that I justified doing interviews was by criticising existing research and existing journals who only used surveys so they would use surveys to look at the efficiencies of policies and they, i so go on so how would you criticize their surveys then so i would look at the pros and cons of doing a survey for my particular topic so mm -hmm. i wanted to know about people's perspe uh, perspectives and um, opinions on policy and I don't think you can do that very well in surveys because they're cl often close ended answers. Um, you know, you, you can't see people's facial expressions. Yeah. You're losing all of that mannerism. So that is how I criticised it. And that's how I also justified my own choice of research method. So you'd weigh things. So you tried to weigh things up against each other yeah. and act, yeah. look at something. So there might be some pros to using the service, which might be cost, time, yeah. and everything. Yeah. But you'd ultimately come to a decision based on. The factors and often the context as well exactly. um, so the key thing you ask in there is well sometimes how is the survey done or what is the impacts of the survey or does it yeah. actually match what i need um yeah. so for me there's one two three four five six the six key questions that students can ask but the questions they can ask depends on what subject they're in mm. um and also you need to make this work in your subject so some of the things that might work for Fran in looking at surveys might not work in other for other people doing other things. Yeah. So I wouldn't be able to look at a limitation on survey data. I wouldn't be able to say, well, how many people has this survey got? 
Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so, for example, it, some of the questions you could ask are who? So, like, who wrote the paper? Uh, who wrote this journal? Who are they? So, I used a student in one of my uh, in one of my third year essays, and that student had only was in a third year when he wrote the essay. So, actually, mm. his authority was in mind. But I chose to use him in my essay because of what the topic was. Mm. So adding the context in, the topic was zero hours contracts. And zero hours contracts was quite a new thing. So there wasn't much literature on it. Mm. So that literature that the student had was one amongst a small field. So how many journals were there? Not many. So therefore, mm. but the reason why I used it was because there wasn't many. So here's me balancing off my head why I'm even using this yeah. journal. Um, but you can so... ask... Yeah. Oh. No, I was going to say, I think zero hour contracts is very interesting because it is, it's highly politicised as well. So in terms of content, it can be quite emotional. So you can weigh up people's bias, maybe. Yeah. Uh, that's something to take into consideration when you're looking at the who, um, particularly for those sorts of topics. Yeah. So, for example, if you're hearing uh, one thing you could ask now, for example, in that particular area is about what the context of it might be. So some people right now might be massively in favour of zero's contracts because if you're having to lay people off, then zero's contracts might not might be good because they have less rights. But also, are they good for a person? So who's writing? Are they someone who's on a zero's contract? Are they someone who's a professor in the subject? Are they someone who works for the government? Do they own a company with lots of people on them? It depends who's written it. Uh, it depends on how trustworthy they are and also what types of questions you can ask. The next thing you can ask is what? So what is the source? Um, what is a great question? What are the times? Things like that. Um, so I often ask, what am, is it I'm reading? So you might say, okay, I'm reading a newspaper. How trustworthy is that compared to a journal? Yeah. Is it Wikipedia? Is it a book? And sometimes there's criticisms you can make there. So for example, books, they take so long to get published that you could ask questions and say, well, actually, is that current data? Um, so when was this book published? Even if it's been published in 2019, does that mean it's 2019 data? Yeah. Who knows? Um, then there's when, which is a bit like what I just asked then. So when was it published? So advice 20 years ago. How good is that? History, amazing. Law, depends on the law. Mm. Um, so yeah, where where is it published? Does it even have an impact on the UK? So if you're writing about the UK, is a source published in... Uh, New Guinea's any relevance? Mm. Don't know. Might be. Depends on the context. Uh, the final two questions are how and why. So we've already said about how, like how big is the, the scope of the field mm. and why. So why does someone publish that? And they're always good questions to ask. So they're questions that I ask when I'm being critical. And Fran, you also ask them as well. But you don't always ask them in that way. So, but you sometimes you ask questions with those words in. Yeah, so, I think having those questions when you're first starting off with an essay is super helpful. And when you first got, you know, you pick your first journal, this is what you're going to criticise and having those questions. And even if it's just answering them like bullet points, you'll get to a point where you're so used to criticising academically mm -hmm. that you won't need those as almost your training wheels anymore. Um, but you're completely right. It's the basis of everything that I was saying. So they are highly useful. And all that you need to do is you need to translate those into your individual assignment or essay. One thing that some people that I spoke to said that they were quite afraid of was that, especially in the first year, was about being critical of people like professors. I'm only a student. How can I be critical of this professor's work that's out there? How can I ask questions? And so some people are quite nervous about that. And the answer is, you, well, you can do. Cool. And you can be. Um, but finally, one thing that's really important about critica criticism is that critical analysis means both doesn't just mean ne being negative to people. It, just, it doesn't always mean discrediting a source. Often you can show critical analysis by actually supporting a source. Mm -hmm. So critical means negative and positive. So sometimes you might support a source by saying by posing another source that argues this thing, mm -hmm. or you might find a weakness and say actually this isn't a weakness because X, Y, and Z supports it. Yeah. So when you're being critical, make sure that you are also being positive think to things as well as also just being negative. Yeah, I think a good word to use sometimes, a good synonym, um, is questioning. 
So mm. if you imagine being with a friend and you're asking questions about their job, you're asking questions about their family, it's often because something really nice has happened. You want to know more about it. Um, and if I think about, um, just to go back to the point that you said, Alex, about authority and questioning academic staff, what's happening more and more, which I love, is um, in professional circles is coaching rather than mentoring. Mm -hmm. So mentoring being, um, it's often someone who's more senior, often older, who is passing on um, in one direction, knowledge and advice to someone who is junior. And coaching, which is bringing that into the 21st century, if you ask me, is that two-way conversation. What can this junior member of staff um, or junior researcher, what perspective can they bring to someone who's been in the field for mm. longer? Because it's refreshing. You know, we're often from different generations with different perspectives. Um, and that exchange of knowledge both ways is important. So I would urge students to um, really add their ideas to the field in that way and not, not to be afraid of uh, undermining people. So there really is good reason to be critical then. Yes. Um, yeah. So we... As well as also asking Fran and give my own views on how you can be critical, uh, we ask students on social media how they can be critical. And so here are just a summary of the student voices on social media. So the first student said that they would question everything. So what do you think about that, Fran? Yeah, be a detective, be an investigator. Yeah. True crime's big at the moment. Let's do it. No, I think completely. Um, there's yeah there's so many issues in the world at the moment and if we were just thinking about us having an impact on the future we're going to have to question things so both within and without assignment so i'm all for that i think that's fab okay i agree with you as well uh the second student said break up the question into smaller chunks and use it to plan then relate back throughout so what do you think about that yeah, very wise owl, I think. That's good. I is think that, that what too. you do, Alex? And your... uh, that is something that I do. Yeah, I break it up into yeah. lots of parts, put it into the structure. Yeah. And actually, as I research, I be critical. So when I read a source, I think, okay, what are the questions I can ask of this source? And yeah. then because I backwards plan it, I'm thinking, actually, that's criticism I need to be doing while I'm researching. And then sometimes yeah. I go, okay, great. This is what I can be critical of it. Is there any other sources out there that might help me with this part that I've got? I'm starting sure. to develop. Yeah. Um, so that's what I do. Uh, the next student actually backs it up quite a bit and says, uh, read a lot so you can compare. So oh. I was talking then about how I would find something, potentially a criticism, and then I'd read something else extra. They're saying read mm. lots and then you can look at, okay, here's this person's argument, here's this person's argument. Great, especially if you're going to get mm. first. Wide mm. reading is something you really... Uh, you can evidence and you can evidence it quite easily i was surprised by i thought i hadn't read much when i had done some of my assignments and i was told that i done a really really good job of reading widely that's just because i read a lot of sources to the extent that i needed to read them yeah and so i didn't think i was good enough for that category but i was by just yeah. reading uh, quite a few different journals and seeing what they said oh here's something so it good sounds like you probably balance probably balance quality and quantity to a good extent so you didn't feel mm. like you'd overexerted yourself um so what you were writing was both broad and in depth which is yeah. probably the the dream for an academic writing um or sorry marking a student's work and speaking about that there is sometimes you can sometimes have too many sources so if you have your entire essay made up of just other people's journals yeah you do need to actually to analyze them and ask them questions and to actually come to conclusions and so there is sort of a balance to do between having a paper that's 2000 words and has 100 like i don't know 300 references in it absolutely yes where you can't actually use them references or explain what the point of them is yeah and also one which has two references in it and it's just a load of waffle yeah. so there's a balance in the between there that you need to try and achieve um, so my history teacher always said your essay will be strongest when you are able to take out your quotations and the evidence and you still have a structure that is present mm. so the evidence is there to support and yeah. going back to your 
PCL method, mm -hmm. you can't have the evidence without the explanation, and that's where yeah. your voice comes in. So. And you're being explicit with that. So you don't, if yeah. you take out that the evidence, it would yeah. still hopefully make sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's a really good advice. Um, the next student said, don't just be negative, reach some form of conclusion. Again, echoing what I said earlier yeah. about being both negative and positive, but also adding the, the part, reach some form of conclusion, which I think is critical, is don't just say, by the way, this source has not ha let's say uh by the way this source has been written by uh, a student what does that mean what's the point how is that relevant so you've got to make sure you justify that sort of thing and finally the final student said never assume that one theory is right or best that's where you compare mm -hmm. the theories and have a look at lots of different theories and make a decision um so that is all the student voices thank you very much for getting in touch with us on social media about those voices um uh we really do appreciate all of your social media comments and also the student voices who were interviewed as part of the student voices section um so finally fran have you got any last words or a last piece of advice that you would want to give oh i've given so much advice you i've have. learned a lot as well Good. um no i think that it is it's actually really nice to sit and reflect on you know our own practice and i think you're adding mm. another podcast on um to to take that into consideration and um, that element of really reflecting on your work afterwards because yes. it's not often that my friends ask me about critical analysis because we talk about other things um but actually no it's been it's yeah. been really nice and i hope that this is a good reflective opportunity for everyone that's got chance to to listen at the moment so good i'm glad that you liked it thank you very much for your contributions yeah. no, Fran. of course I, I really appreciate you coming onto the podcast uh, I have one last piece of advice that I am going to give before I end the podcast, and that is about uh, when I actually start writing my pod my thing. So I often write my introduction and my conclusion last, and that's because I then know what I'm actually going to conclude. Um, so we talked a bit in the second part of the podcast, so if you haven't seen that, check it out, about your structure. But with your introduction and conclusion, your conclusion don't add anything new in, but you don't know what's new until you've actually written it. So write that last, or second to last, and then your introduction, you should basically say what's coming. And you know what's coming properly in the points you want to make and the conclusions that you're going to make in your introduction if you've written it all. So I would always write last, especially because it's really hard to get started in writing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's my final piece of advice. Uh, thank you very much for coming on, Fran. I really appreciate okay. your, your advice and your, your support in both being on this podcast and also in giving such so much of your time so the next episode of the assignment journey is one of the crucial episodes it's finally proofreading and also referencing your your assignment so the key part about that is that you'll do loads more in proofreading than just checking your spelling punctuation and grammar tune into that episode to find out more but until then thank you very much for watching and i appreciate it that you spent the time watching all this podcast. Uh, final note, uh, I do apologise for the quality of this podcast being slightly lower than the usual standard. Um, that is because this has been recorded in a different format through Teams uh, due to the current working from home situation that the university has. Um, so I hope I appreciate the fact that you've watched all of this and seen this part. And thank hopefully I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye. <laughs>